It is always a delight to open the Word here and to be with uh, my friends at Bayside. And uh, we, um, as I've mentioned uh, occasionally in the past, one of the challenges with coming to Bayside is the fact that you're not coming back next week. So whatever it is you're doing, you better finish it this week. And you are not totally familiar with what has happened in the past couple of months. So you really kind of in a unique way, I think, depend upon the Lord for guidance in um, um, the selection of what it is that he wants uh, a speaker to speak on. And as I prayed about it, and uh, um, it, there were a couple of things that have impressed me, uh, and those are the, have resulted in what we're going to be looking at this morning. I think one of the most uh, terrible and fearful thoughts for a believer is that horrible thought that... Uh, that when they die, they just might end up in hell. That somewhere along the line, they might lose their salvation. And this is actually a, a significant problem for a lot of believers. And, and part of the reason why we're going to look at that today today, that subject, is that over the past couple of months, there have been a number of folks, for whatever reasons, who have registered some real concern about this. Are we sure that when we die as those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, are we sure that we aren't going to somehow find ourselves having lost our salvation somewhere along the line? And if this is not a problem for you, and I hope it is not, I can assure you that there are believers swirling around you who do have that as a problem, uh, who do have that as a concern. And so this morning, I want us to look at the absolute, emphasis upon absolute, the absolute security of the believer in Jesus Christ. So... <clears throat> Anytime you do uh, a topic like this, uh, it is absolutely essential that we know what we're talking about, the definition of terms. Good theology is based upon good definition. And so in your uh, outline, we want to walk uh, quickly through some things just for the sake making sure that we, in fact, are on the same page and what all of this means. The whole question of what is eternal security, it is the uh, biblical truth that when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ and they are born again, they are declared righteous by God and that there is absolutely uh, no exception that every believer who has come to faith in Christ is going to enter into the future kingdoms of God. Um, it is a work of God that guarantees us. Now, hey, look, if it were dependent upon us, we would all be in deep trouble. But it isn't dependent upon us. It is dependent upon God. And that's what we want to make sure that we are very, very clear on. So eternal security is the truth that when a person places their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are forever secure. They cannot, they will not lose their regeneration. God has once for all declared them righteous, and as a result, we shall enter into the future kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> there's another term called the perseverance of the saints, and I am interested how over the years, that believers have the question, are these the same thing? Is perseverance of the saints and eternal security the same thing? And the answer is no, they are not. And there's a huge difference between the two, which may, may not be a surprise to you. The perseverance of the saints focuses on human effort. It focuses on the idea that we, uh, if we are in fact regenerate people, will end up um, 
never failing at the end. We might stumble a bit, but we will never fail at the end. We are going to end up true to our faith in Jesus Christ, which, of course, is not a New Testament teaching. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira did not end well, if you remember. The saints at Corinth, who, because of their sacrilege, God took them prematurely, they didn't end well. 1 John 5 is very clear that there are, for believers, sins unto death. In other words, a believer can end poorly in this life. But they are still secure because of the work of God. So when you look at Reformed theology, they are very heavily into the idea of the perseverance of the saints. Just for clarity's sake, that is not the same thing as eternal security. One focuses on the work of God, eternal security. The other focuses on the efforts of people. And this is why you will find that that folks who adhere to the idea of the perseverance of the saints have little assurance of their salvation because they don't know how they're going to end up this life. Which then brings us to the whole issue of what is assurance? Well, <clears throat> assurance has to do with what you think about your salvation, it has to do with how you feel or what you sense uh, uh, your spiritual condition might be. A person who is eternally secure may not have assurance for a, a number of reasons. They may adhere to a theology which says that you can lose your salvation. And though they are regenerate people, they may not live with any kind of assurance. They may be scared to death all the time that they're not going to end well or that they're going to sin in such a way that they lose everything in the end. Assurance, I have assurance because of what the Scriptures say, not because of my behavior, <laughs> I am assured that I am saved because God says he's going to do that. So the assurance of salvation uh, has really nothing to do with the eternal security. A person may not believe in eternal security, and the result is they may not have assurance. But the reality is that uh, assurance has to do with how we think or feel at a given moment. I don't know right now if you feel assured that you're going to go to heaven. I hope so. But if you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven whether you, whether you sense that's going to happen or not. Why? Well, simply because God says so, as we'll see in a few moments. Now, <clears throat> one other thing, and this is far beyond what we can do here, but one of the things that causes people to teach that you can lose your salvation is a, is a real misunderstanding of the biblical terms saved and salvation. When we hear the word saved, we sort of press the, the default button that takes us to the idea of justification by faith. And yet more than half the time uh, in um, the Old Testament, about 10% of the time in the Old Testament, do saved and salvation ever mean that? They have the idea of deliverance from something, but not necessarily deliverance from hell. In the New Testament, interestingly enough, it's, you have about one-third of the time or so, does saved and salvation have anything to do with justification by faith? The terms mean deliverance from something unto something else. Uh, a famous example, remember the woman who um, was ill, and she said to herself as she saw Jesus, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be saved. Well, that's what the older versions read, but we know that that causes a tremendous amount of confusion in people's thinking, that if we can only touch Jesus' uh, garment, we're going to somehow get eternal life. Well, that's not what the word means at all. But time and time again, in the New Testament, the word saved has simply that kind of deliverance. A woman will be saved in childbearing, Paul says. Well, that makes no sense at all. If, you know, a woman has to have a baby in order to get eternal life, 
But that's not what Paul is talking about. My point is that when you deal with people who are talking about the fact you can, the idea you can lose your salvation, they oftentimes simply misunderstand and misuse passages that talk about saved and salvation because we have this one way of thinking about that word. So <clears throat> eternal security is God's guarantee that we're going to um, enter into his eternal kingdom when we have received the Lord Jesus as personal Savior. Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans um, chapter 8, and I want to look at some key passages for not only to reinforce in your own heart and mind the reality of what we have said, that, that you are secure as a believer in Jesus Christ, but also that you'll have a good handle on, on some of the passages that you might find uh, you can share with other people who uh, are just not real sure about all of this. In Romans chapter 8, um, in verses 29 and 30, we have these five steps that Paul mentions where God takes a person um, from their unregenerate condition into the position of being glorified. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called, a moment in time in history where a person is called to a relationship with Christ, uh, that moment when you trusted Christ as your Savior. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. The, the thing I want to begin with is this emphasis that Paul says that when a person receives Christ, they are called unto salvation. God justifies them. And as you know, that is a courtroom term where God the judge declares a believer not innocent, but righteous, so that we have our sin and guilt removed and the righteousness of Christ put on our account. It is pure grace on God's part. But the important thing is this, that those he justified, he also glorified, which is the final step or the final phase of our salvation. Now, <clears throat> as I look around this room, and as you look at me, we realize that glorification has obviously eluded all of us. We still have a sin nature, so we, we do sin. We are not in glorified bodies that can live forever. In fact, our bodies are, are clearly betraying us time and time again. But the way Paul frames this is important, that if you have been declared righteous by God, which is what took place when you in simple faith asked Jesus to be your Savior, at that moment, he also glorified you. It's a future event, but it's a done deal as far as God's concerned. Every individual who has been declared righteous by God has been glorified by God. He has, in fact, brought to a finish our salvation. We haven't experienced it yet, but it is a sure thing. And the Scriptures will do this sometimes, taking something that is yet future and seeing it as a past action that it is so sure that this is the case. Are you a justified person? Has God declared you righteous? If he has, then you are also glorified. It's a done deal. There is no question about this. So this is a powerful statement by the Apostle Paul, and it only gets better as he proceeds along where he asks three different questions. Verse 31, what shall we say then? If God is for us, 
who is against us. If we can somehow thwart God's declared purposes, then, of course, we have elevated ourselves of, uh, to a level of sovereignty and power over God himself, which, of course, is not the case. If we can somehow stop the process, uh, we are greater than God. But we can't, and the question is, God, who has already worked in our lives, he has done the great work of saving us, of justifying us, and he is going to complete his work sometime in the future in allowing glorification to become a reality. The second question, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Now, we know Satan is the accuser of the brethren, so he's always accusing us. But Paul's point is, the judge has already ruled on the matter. And as in our legal system, double jeopardy applies. Once a crime has been dealt with in some way, you don't redo it again. God the judge has looked at you, he has looked at me, and he has said... This person is more than innocent. They are righteous. So if the judge, the creator of the universe, has made that declaration, who could bring the issue up again? And the answer is nobody can. I mean, Satan attempts to, but he can't. There's, there's no value. There's no validity in what he has to say. No legitimate charge can be brought, no matter what you do, no matter what I do. No legitimate charge can be brought against us. The judge has already ruled on our particular case. We are now possessors of the righteousness of Christ. Question number three, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And so he says um, in verse 35, he goes through a list of things. Shall tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness, peril or sword? I'm going jumping down to verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, that's sort of all-inclusive, isn't it? Kind of covers everything right there. Um, nor angels, holy angels, good angels, nor principalities, fallen angels, demonic beings, nor any other created thing, which, by the way, includes you, includes me, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he goes through this list of things, which if you look at very carefully, would include outside forces like angels, but also inner workings like our own failures, and his point is very clear. He says there is absolutely nothing, nothing in this universe that can separate a believer from the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing. If there was an exception, like you are the exception that you can somehow lose this, uh, Paul is remiss in not telling us that. So this is a powerful, powerful section, but it only gets better as we, we look at the work of the, Holy, of, the, uh, of the Trinity. And this is the key, in my thinking, as to our security in Jesus Christ. If you have uh, your Bible, you might want to flip over to John chapter 10 for a moment to a familiar uh, passage. Um, <clears throat> in John chapter 10, verse 29... Jesus says, my father, who has given them to me, talking about his sheep, those who have joined his flock, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. Now, that's a pretty inclusive term, isn't it? All. But he goes on and says, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Please underscore in your thinking or in your Bible or both, no one, no one, and that includes you. If there was an exception, 
which is what that theology teaches, that you can lose your salvation, the exception being that I can sin and therefore remove myself from the Father's hand. Jesus is remiss in not telling us this because that would be a huge exception we ought to know about. But how much clearer can he be, folks? No one takes them out of the Father's hand. No one has the power to do that. You don't have the power. Your sins don't have the power. No one is able to take them out of the Father's hand. You see, the theology that teaches that you can lose your salvation emphasizes that you can do it by your sinning. Jesus says, not so. No one, which includes you, can remove yourself from the Father's hand. The role of the, the Lord Jesus, sticking with John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says, and I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them, which by the way, um, what do we get when we trust Christ as Savior? We get eternal life, not conditional life. That when you and I received the Lord Jesus as Savior, we, came, we became the present possessors of eternal life, which is not endless existence, as you know. It is the life of God himself, according to John 17. You have the life of God himself. I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. And, Paul, uh, and uh, Jesus uses a double negative. Now, in Greek, double negatives reinforce something. In English, it's just the opposite. But in Greek, that's good grammar. Not, no, never will you be able to um, take yourself out of my hand. I give them eternal life. They shall never, not never, perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Again, the same issue. If you can do this, then you are more powerful, not only of the more powerful than the Father, but you're also more powerful than the Son. And Jesus, again, is culpable in misleading us if, in fact, we can do that. So I do not um, care, I do, but you know, what kind of sinning we might do. Um, but the one thing that cannot happen and does not happen is that no matter what your sins you think might be or might be, you cannot take yourself out of the Father's hand and you cannot take yourself out of the hand of the Lord Jesus. Jesus had earlier said in John chapter 6, and verse 38, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all, notice that Jesus insists on using these inclusive terms, that all that he has sent me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. God, Christ does not lose anybody. No exceptions, again, are given. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son, that is, and believes in him, may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And as you comb through these passages, and you think about what Jesus is saying, you come to the realization that there are simply no exceptions anywhere. No exceptions. The moment you say that I am the exception, you have now elevated yourself to a place of omnipotence because you now have become more powerful than God. And we, of course, none of us would believe that. But not only is the Father committed, not only is the Son committed, but so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a variety of ministries to us the moment that we are saved. Regeneration, you know, he gives life. Um, 
And he also, among other things, indwells us, but he seals us as well. And, um, oh, I think it was last spring when uh, I was here, we spent one of our time studying the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And so I took uh, an old slide from there and uh, took a look at um, uh, the matter of sealing, the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And when we comb through the scriptures, we discover that uh, in the New Testament, the concept of sealing carries three ideas with it. One is ownership. Um, one is that of a transaction, a business transaction that is finished. And those, of course, are all true. The moment we trusted Christ, uh, we now belong to him in a, in a new way as Savior. The transaction is completed, as we're going to be looking at in the next hour. And also the matter of security. So <clears throat> Ephesians 1.13 says, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. This tells us when the sealing takes place. The Holy Spirit does the sealing. He is the seal itself, himself, and it has the idea of security. So when did we become secure? When were we sealed by the Spirit? The moment we believed. Having believed, you were sealed. You and I probably didn't know what was going on the moment we trusted Christ as Savior, but one of the things that happened is that at that moment we were made eternally secure. Well, how long does this last? Well, Ephesians 4.30 says that by the Holy Spirit you were sealed for or unto the day of redemption, which is the day of our final salvation when we are glorified. The sealing, the securing work of the Holy Spirit keeps us safe. From the moment we believe to the moment we are with Christ. That's an ongoing ministry of the Spirit. So this is why I like to say, and have said to my students over the years, the good news is, by a vote of three to nothing, we are secure. The Father votes for us, the Son votes for us, and the Holy Spirit votes for us, and each one of the persons of the Godhead are committed to keeping us secure, and there is no question that that's exactly what's going to happen. So keep these passages in mind, but there's so much more which we will go through rather quickly. When you look at passages like John 3.16, John 5.24, where we are told that by believing you receive eternal life and are free from coming judgment. Again, the concept of eternal life is not the idea that it's conditional, that it's somehow, um, that this life that we get, whatever it might be, is somehow conditioned on our behavior. It is not. It is the life of God, and it is something that we possess right now, and we will possess all the way into the eternal kingdom of God. You look at passages where uh, Jesus saves us completely and forever, like in Hebrews. Um, just came across this uh, a week ago again, this reminder that Christ's work in us will be uh, perfected in the day of Christ, which is a reference in Philippians 1 to the rapture event, the day of Christ. So again and again, in passage after passage, which uh, uh, communicates the idea of our, of our security in the Lord Jesus, because God is committed to it. Again, if it really depended upon you, to keep yourself secure, then I'm not, I'm not betting on you for sure, myself included. I just know myself too well. But the reality is that it doesn't depend upon me and it doesn't depend upon you. God has said, those he has justified, he has already glorified. Those are powerful statements. There's no wiggle room 
for the loss of God's life. Now, we only have a few minutes, um, but what I want to do is just at least bring to the surface some of those commonly used passages where um, uh, people will teach from them that uh, you can, in fact, um, lose this life that God has given to you. In Galatians chapter 5, uh, Paul has made it clear that these people have begun by means of the Holy Spirit, that is, they were justified um, by faith, and the Holy Spirit regenerated them. And now, as they live life, they are to also live by means of the Holy Spirit. And so, he comes to chapter 5 and verse 4, and how many times have you heard about somebody falling from grace? Usually, you know, some Christian leader has misbehaved and they have fallen from grace. And Paul puts it this way. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Well, again, context is everything. And when you go back to the passage, you discover that the, he is not talking about justification, that this has nothing to do with the idea of the loss of salvation. That's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Well, here's what he's talking about. He is telling them that as believers now, people who have been declared righteous by God, they've been justified by faith, they are now to continue a life of faith in the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. He points out and has pointed out, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, that you and I, as we live the Christian life, cannot live in our own power or our own energy. Our flesh simply cannot produce the will of God. The flesh cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. We must have the working of the Holy Spirit in the process of our sanctification. And it is not in law-keeping, but it is in the grace of God, the empowerment, which he will explain in a few verses in chapter 5 later, that this is where the Holy Spirit and Christ works. And here's his point. He is talking to believers who are being persuaded by Jewish Christians that they need to keep the law, that the law is still the standard and rule of life. And Paul says, it is not. And if you insist on keeping the law, what you are doing is leaving the realm of grace living, living in the power of the Holy Spirit, and you have effectively removed yourself from the area where Christ operates and where the Holy Spirit is. Now, you had that experience. As believers, we've all had this experience where we have insisted on doing things in the, our own power. We resolve to do this. And so with the energy of the flesh, with the will, we say, we are going to do this. And we fail to recognize that the only way we can live a godly life and produce love, joy, peace, and so on is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only entity, the only person who can deal with our flesh. And so these believers have been becoming persuaded that we need to now keep the law code in order to be sanctified. And Paul says, you leave the realm of Christ and the Spirit in your Christian life and become a legalist. You have removed yourself. If you don't like the word fallen, change it. But the idea is you, receive, you remove yourself out of the realm of grace. And by the way, did you notice something? It's not a matter of them entering into sin, is it? The issue is not sin here. The issue is law keeping. He's not saying you people have entered into the realm of sin. He says you're entering into the realm of law keeping. And you can't have both. 
in living the Christian life. So, <clears throat> in practical terms, he is simply saying, you've removed yourself from the one source of power that allows you to live a godly life, and the power is that of the Holy Spirit. This is commonly used for losing your salvation. The discussion is not justification, it is sanctification. And furthermore, the issue is not entering into sin, it's entering into law-keeping. So while this is commonly used, it simply is not talking about it. It's not talking about losing your salvation. Now, let me move on to another area very quickly, and I realize that we're not doing justice to all of this. If we were looking at Galatians, we would look at the, uh, take a running start into chapter 5. The book of Hebrews is a favorite ground for those who teach that salvation can be lost. There are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews, and it is very clear that the writer to the Hebrews is teaching the idea that you can lose something. And there is no question, if you allow language to be language, that those who are the recipients of this sermon we call Hebrews are believers in Christ. They are regenerated people. Uh, the terminology that's used throughout the book of Hebrews unequivocally says these people are believers. They are not professed believers. They are real believers. So what are they going to lose? If you read the passages carefully, you'll find that never is the subject justification by faith. That's not what the book is about. The, the book is about loss, but the loss of significance and the loss of reward in the Messianic age. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, verse 5, what he's talking about. He's talking about the rule of Jesus Christ on this earth. That's what I'm talking about, he says. It is not justification by faith. So the great issue in the book of Hebrews is warning of the loss that a believer can incur, incur in the Messianic age. Now, again, we can't do justice to the subject matter, but I wanted to at least raise uh, the issue on several of the commonly used passages. Um, you remember how he ends the book of Hebrews, perhaps, in chapter 11, by showing here are believers who walked with God, who hung in there. You guys need to hang in there, he says. But don't be like Esau. And he uses that famous story where Esau swapped his birthright for lunch. And he says, in essence, how do you spell stupid? E-S-A-U. Here is a guy who mortgaged his future for present comfort. And he's telling these believers, don't be like that. You have a wonderful future in the Messianic age. Don't mortgage reward, future significance, opportunity, everything that's going to be a part of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Don't mortgage that for present comfort now by becoming disloyalty to Christ and to his church. One more passage, and then we'll have to stop because... But I, I, as I was going through this, I realized I'm not doing justice to these uh, portions, but these are commonly used. Hebrews is not talking about losing salvation. It's never a part of the discussion at all. The other one is the famous vine and branches, where Jesus makes it clear that branches uh, are, um, he's the vine, they are the we are the branches, we feed off of him, and it is the desire of the Lord, the Father, to prune the branches so that we bear a lot of fruit. And he says that there's two categories of branches. One are barren. They just don't bear any fruit. They end up being taken away. And then there's fruitful branches where the Father constantly works with uh, them to produce more fruit. Now, there's no question, absolutely no question, that the people that Jesus is talking to are believers. He's talking to the 11 apostles in the upper room, Judas has bailed out, so he's talking to believers, his men. 
You're clean, he said. You're already clean. And he said, but we want you to bear fruit. Now, um, we're going to... So the command is given. You want to bear fruit, you have to abide in Christ. You have to remain in fellowship uh, with him. And it's something you and I are to do. Um, You want a life of value? You have to abide in Christ. The secret of fruit bearing is abiding. The secret of abiding is obeying. Very simple. So there are three results uh, that come from abiding in Christ. One is a life that has meaning, a productive life. He says that such a life uh, brings about uh, God's response to answer prayer in an unusual way. And then one of the great benefits is that our lives are characterized by joy because God brings joy into our lives when we're obedient. Well, that's fine. But what happens if you don't? And in John chapter 15, Jesus uses very graphic terminology of branches being gathered. Uh, The Father has attempted to uh, um, work with them to bring about fruit, and it just hasn't happened. And so there is a consequence, and that is um, discipline, temporal judgment. So he talks about being burned in the fire. And like with the book of Hebrews, when we hear fire, we think of uh, eternal damnation or hell. And that's not the way it's used. It's not the way it's used in the book of Hebrews. It is talking about God's temporal judgment, his judgment in time right now. That's what is going to take place. So John, and by the way, when I went to Russia, the Russian Baptists love John 15, 6 because they believe in eternal insecurity. They believe you can lose your salvation. This is one of their favorite passages. There's no question he's talking to believers. They're apostles. But the point that he is making is that um, God does deal with an unfruitful Christian, that things come, that come into the life of an unfruitful Christian are oftentimes the... the the uh, temporary, temporal, present tense disciplines of God. Well, I'm going to have to stop now. There are a lot of passages that are used, but if you remember a couple things, one is that the context where people take these passages and teach you can lose your salvation are, number one, Um, usually talking about the loss of something else, particularly that of reward. And the context, generally speaking, simply is not talking about the matter of justification by faith at all. So I hope this sort of reinforces in your own heart and mind the reality that once we are saved, we are saved for eternity because of the power of God. Uh, who keeps us safe. Lord, I do pray that we would rejoice and I, in the fact that you have promised no exceptions, that all those of us who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus will in fact enter into your presence and forever be with you in your eternal kingdom. I pray that as we live our lives, we would not only uh, be encouraged by this reality, but that we would be ready to share your word with many of our brothers and sisters who, in fact, are very concerned about what awaits them in the future, believing that they could lose it all. So I pray that we would be good ministers of your word in their lives. Thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the fact that we who have been justified have already been glorified. Thank you, Father, for that. We give you praise in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.